Hi, everybody. Good morning, good evening in Pakistan. Salam alaikum. I'd like to welcome everybody to the latest installment of the COVID Dialogues, uh, co sponsored uh, by the Johns Hopkins Center for Global Emergency Care and the Aga Khan Center of Excellence for Trauma and Emergencies. I'm Dr. Nico Risco at Johns Hopkins, and today we have two special guests uh, who have uh, a talent and expertise in the use and interpretation of ultrasound in the emergency setting. We're going to hear from them about the use of a thoracic ultrasound in COVID patients. I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Danielle Matilski and Dr. Muhammad Beg. Dr. Matilski is Assistant Professor of Emergency Medicine at Johns Hopkins and Director of Emergency Ultrasound at Howard County General Hospital. She completed her residency training at Mount Sinai St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital in New York City and subspecialty training in point of care ultrasound and global health at University of Pennsylvania. And her areas of interest include ultrasound education and development, uh, particularly in uh, low resource environments. I also have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Mohammed Akbar Beg, who is a fellow in the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Pakistan in the Dipl discipline of emergency medicine and holds the position of senior instructor at the Department of Emergency Medicine in Aga Khan University Hospital. His clinical interests include resuscitation, point of care ultrasound, and the application of innovative teaching methods for education in emergency medicine. So for today, first up, we're gonna have some didactic material and some wonderful slides from Dr. Matilski. Then we'll turn it over to Dr. Beg for a glimpse of how ultrasound is being used in Pakistan and we'll open the floor for questions afterwards. And we will uh, flash up the website that you can use to send uh, questions to. Uh, again, if you have a question that comes up, please email it to coe.te at aku.edu. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Dr. Matilski, uh, to uh, hear your wonderful presentation. All right. Good afternoon and good evening, everybody, and good morning to the people in the US. Um, I am uh, very honored to be here to speak to you about thoracic ultrasound and the acute respiratory patient. So I'm gonna share my slides with you and we'll get started. Okay. Um, so as uh, Dr. Risco mentioned, my area of expertise is point of care ultrasound um, in the emergency department. And we're gonna talk about how you can use thoracic ultrasound to approach the acute respiratory patient, specifically with regards to COVID-19. Before we start, we're gonna to touch base on a few basic ultrasound principles, just so that we're all talking about the same things with the same language. We're gonna talk very briefly about the machine selection, and then we'll move on to just specifics about thoracic ultrasound and COVID-19, as well as some of, some of the protocols that have been proposed for this specific illness. So you all are familiar with these four modalities that we have um, in, our, in most of our emergency departments, a stethoscope, an x-ray, CAT scan, maybe have some ultrasound. Um, and most recently, we're seeing the use of these handheld devices. Um, and we can talk about the strengths of each of these but um, there's been a publication in The Lancet that talks about more ultrasound and less stethoscope, and I'll show you why I think that's really helpful. So why would we choose ultrasound as a modality to assess these patients? Firstly, it's relatively inexpensive. So if you're in a resource-limited area where you don't have access to advanced imaging, such as CAT scan, um, this is a great alternative. It's fairly easy to do, and I'm gonna show you how. Um, one of the best pieces of this is that it's performed and interpreted by the clinician that's taking care of that sick patient right there at the bedside. That means that you don't need to send the patient out of your department to a radiology suite. You don't need to rely on a technician to perform the scan. You don't need another provider to tell you how to interpret it. You're going to do all of those things right there at the bedside. It's also repeatable. So if things change, the clinical picture develops, you know, you're able to repeat that ultrasound. And of course, it's safe for the patient. Um, so um, before we move on and talk about lung ultrasound, I just wanted to go over a few um, ultrasound basics. And ultrasound is all about physics. It's um, a wave that's traveling through a media in the body. 
And for the most part, um, velocity in the body, how fast the sound wave is going to travel is fairly fixed. And so the thing that we can manipulate to change our images is the frequency of the sound and the wavelength at which it comes out. So you might wonder how an uh, image is created. And the way the traditional ultrasound probes work is that they're lined with crystals along the top of the probe. And as we apply heat or electricity to these crystals, what we see is that the crystals shake and emit sound waves. And then the uh, probe is gonna listen for the echo of the sound as it returns. And that's how it's gonna create an image. I'm not going to go through all of this vocabulary because we're sort of limited in time, but if you need to remind yourself so that you're able to understand the literature about lung ultrasound, these are some really important um, things to know so you can interpret the literature and what they're talking about. So the first thing to do to um, create ultrasound images is to choose the frequency of probe you're going to use. And in lung ultrasound, you may use all three of these probes. So you have a linear probe, a uh, curvilinear probe, and a phased array probe. Um, the differences between these are their frequencies. So frequency is something that you guys know just from your life. And of course, this is not social distancing, so I don't know how many of us have been at a concert like this recently. Um, but if you've ever gone to a concert and you've driven into the parking lot and you've parked your car in that parking lot, you can hear that low frequency sound of a bass. It's kind of that low boom, boom, boom. You can hear it way out into the parking lot. And that's because it's a low frequency sound and it can travel really far distances. So our curvilinear and phased array probes are low frequency probes and they can travel deeper into the body's tissue, but the sound isn't very crisp. It's kind of that muffled low bass sound versus the high frequency pro, um, sounds, which when you go into a concert, this is gonna be your cymbals, or if you're going to a um, orchestra, the violin. Those high frequency sounds, you can only hear them when you get close into the venue, but they're crisp and they're really like clean sound. That's a high frequency probe analogy. So in the same way that that low frequency probe can travel deep into the body, but it gives you kind of not the best picture, high frequency probes can't travel as far, so you're not going to get as much depth, but the resolution on the screen is going to be better. So let's take a look at that. Here's an example of lungs in both uh, of these images. Uh, in the left-hand image, you're looking mostly at, um, you're only three centimeters deep, and you're seeing the plural line is that bright white line. Let me see if I can get my probe to... Um, as we talk. Um, second, let's see. So can you guys see a, a marker here? Okay. So here is our uh, linear, this is our uh, plural line here. And here's the shadow from a rib and another shadow from a rib. And you can see that this plural line is nice and crisp. We're using a high frequency probe here. We're getting uh, better resolution, but not so much depth, only three centimeters of depth. As compared to this image, which is a low frequency, we're using the curvilinear probe. Up here is our plural line. It's not as crisp, but we can certainly see much deeper. And we're seeing an artifact here called B lines. And so choosing your probe is going to ch uh, change which, um, what kind of image you're going to create on the screen. The next thing you want to do is to control your depth. This is going to control the listening time of the probe. And so here on the left hand side, we see all of this area. If our object of interest is this kidney up here and liver, we don't need any of this depth. We call this wasted real estate. So we want to adjust the depth so that our object of interest is in the center of the screen so that we can get the most uh, resolution and information about those objects that we're interested in. Third, we're going to adjust the gain. So here's a progression of the same image. This is with much too little gain. This is with too much gain. So your question might be, how do I set the gain or the overall brightness of the image correctly? And the answer to that is to choose something that should be black on the screen. So we know that anechoic um, structure is something that's fluid filled on ultrasound. And everywhere in the body, there's going to be fluid filled structures such as blood vessels or blood in the heart in a ventricle or something in the gallbladder or the bladder. So wherever you're scanning, find something that should be black and set the blackness on the screen to that area that is black. And see here it's a little bit too gray. These last two principles are what's going to set apart an amateur scanner from an excellent scanner. So firstly, your focus point. What you want to do is to uh, focus your object of interest in the center of your screen, or if you're able to control your focus point, move your focal point to the object of interest. And this is particularly important when we talk about looking at the plural line, um, because there's a lot of changes in the plural line in um, COVID-19 specifically. Uh, so and the second thing is your dynamic range. And this is my analogy of dynamic range if you're unfamiliar with it. And what we want to think about is the grayscale of the machine. 
So if you think about a small box of crayons, you might only have one purple crayon. It's just purple, that's it. But if you get these kind of more fancy boxes of crayons that have a whole lot more crayon options in it, you might have magenta, fuchsia, violet, you know, all these different colors of purple. And that's the same thing of your dynamic range. The larger your dynamic range on your, on your machine, the more different nuanced colors of gray you're gonna get. So um, if you wanna find small consolidations, increasing your dynamic range might let you get a little bit more detail in the lung tissue. So the next thing we're gonna just briefly touch on is which machine to use. And if you don't have a machine, how do you select a machine for your department if you're, if you're considering purchasing a machine for your department? Um, so this is one of the first ultrasound machines we had, put a whole patient into the bathtub because we know ultrasound travels wonderfully through water. Um, but now you might see something a little bit more familiar like this, a cart-based machine, or again, the handheld machines. If you're working in a resource limited area, before you acquire a machine and set up a program, you wanna consider how are you gonna maintain your machines? This is in Africa somewhere, and you see it, my, the machine is placed on the floor, probably not the best location for something that's you know, robust, but not, not, you know, it's not completely uh, impermeable to injury. Um, so how are you gonna get gel? Who's gonna clean your probes? How will you clean the probes? And we're gonna talk about how to clean machines specifically in COVID-19. Um, who's going to service your machine and how are you going to get them to a place to be serviced? So uh, the World Federation for Ultrasound and Medicine and Biology just published on April 4th a policy statement on how to cl uh, clean your equipment. Um, and this is particularly important in uh, the context of COVID-19 as it's very infectious. Um, so it's a, it's a very thorough article. I highly suggest you look through it. But some of the salient points were have one machine dedicated in your department that's going to be for COVID-19. Um, consider covering the entire machine with a sheath or a cover um, to prevent the smaller areas from being exposed. Um, reduce the number of trans, uh, transducers that you leave on the machine. So many of your machines may have a curvilinear, a linear, and a, a face array probe. If you're only going to be looking at one part of, uh, of the body, like maybe only bring in the curvilinear probe, for example. Um, using single gel packs um, and not the uh, you know, large bottle that would go from room to room and be contaminated. And finally, they talk about cleaning versus disinfection. So cleaning when it just has gel on it, disinfecting when you're doing something like an endocavitary exam uh, on a mucous membrane or a procedure where you're doing um, like placing a central line with ultrasound guidance and there may be blood exposed onto the machine. So let's move into thoracic ultrasound and how we're going to do that. So it used to be that, you know, we thought that long ultrasound was actually impossible because air can't uh, conduct ultrasound waves, um, but this physician, Daniel Lichtenstein, came up in 2008 with something called the Blue Protocol, and then it was revised and has really become part of our um, our toolbox for assessment of the acute uh, respiratory patient. And he developed this alphabet soup of long ultrasound, and I'm going to go through some of this because it's really important to understand what we're talking about in uh, relationship to COVID-19. So what he noted is that there are these different artifacts that the lung exhibits when you're scanning. So the first uh, artifact is A-lines, and they're shown here on this image here. And what we're seeing is a repetitive horizontal line. And it, what it is is a reverberation artifact between the skin and the pleural line that gets replicated in the same interval sort of all the way down the lung. And this represents normal lung tissue. In this image, what he describes is something called B-lines, and these are these sort of long flashlight uh, appearing uh, signals that are traveling from the pleural line, very importantly has to arise from the pleural line here, and travels the entire length of the, of the lung parenchyma. And what we're seeing is a, a significant acoustic, acoustic impedance between fluid in the alveoli and air in the other part of the lung. And what you're getting is a reverberation artifact down the entire length of the lung parenchyma. So if you watch in this video, um, what we're seeing here is we see this is the pleural line and you see the kind of like a flashlight going through the lung. And these are all B lines. And this would be what you'd see in someone who maybe has congestive heart failure, for example. The next artifact we'll talk about is lung sliding. Um, and this really is drawing our attention to the pleural line. And what we're seeing is um, the artifact of the visceral and parietal pleura really sliding on each other. And people have described this as either ants that are sort of marching along or the, the pleural line is sort of shimmering. And this is how we know that the visceral and parietal pleura are intact and that they're sliding against each other. Now, if you introduce a pneumothorax or air in between that space, you're gonna lose that uh, interaction between the two and you won't see any movement. And I'm gonna show you that in the next slide. 
Um, absence of lung flattening doesn't always mean you have a pneumothorax. I just want to warn people of this. For example, if you have an intubated patient, you have the tube in the right main, uh, right main stem, you're not aerating the left lung, you're not going to get any lung flattening because it's not, it's not, doesn't have any air in there. Um, same thing if you've had pleurodesis or you've had a lobectomy or some other reason why your lungs may not slide. The other thing is a very large pleural based pneumonia can become very sticky and prevent lung from sliding as well. So it's not 100% always pneumothorax, um, but the presence of lung sliding rules out a pneumothorax. So here's how we can sort of uh, look at them side by side. So on the left-hand image here that's moving, you see that same image we were just looking at. You see this nice kind of movement along the pleural line. And I want you to draw your attention to, on this side, you're going to look over here where this pleural line is. And as that plays, maybe it doesn't play. There you go. Um, it's playing now. And you can see that um, there is no long sliding on that side. And let's say that this is sort of difficult for you to appreciate. There's another tool we can talk about, which is motion mode. Um, and so everything that you're seeing along these ice picks here, this is called the ice pick. This is represented on the y-axis here. So everything along that ice pick is along this y-axis. And then this, the x-axis is time. And so if you place this motion mode over, over the uh, center of, of two ribs, what you're seeing here is chest wall muscles not moving. So they're kind of look flat. And then you start seeing the movement of the lung beneath it. And people have described this sort of as a seashore. Um, I don't know if it looks like a seashore to you, but that's what people think it looks like. Um, versus on the, uh, on the right side over here, you see that there is no lung sliding, so nothing's really moving. And so it sort of looks a little bit like a barcode maybe on its side. So another way for you to identify lung sliding. And the last thing that we're gonna talk about is um, mirror artifact and the base of the lung to assess for pleural fusions. So uh, here on the left-hand image, what you're seeing is the, uh, this is the liver, the kidney, and this is with, where the pleural space would be. And here is the diaphragm. The diaphragm is an excellent spectral reflector. It's a really reflective surface. So what happens is as the ultrasound beam comes down and it hits this uh, uh, diaphragm, part of the image, get, a part of the sound gets reflected right back, but part of it is gonna get refracted away and then kind of hit the image a second time and get sent back up. And so the machine can't tell um, between one side and the other of this reflector because of the lung being on this side. So what it does is create this mirroring. And what we're seeing here is, um, you know, this little vessel here in, in the liver is sort of recreated over here. This is what normal lung should look like when you assess at the base. As compared to the image over here, where now there's fluid, which is anechoic and black at the base, and now the ultrasound wave can travel through the fluid, and now you're starting to see the, um, the um, artifacts of, of shadowing from the vertebral bodies below in the spine. Um, so here's a more obvious example of that. Um, and this is a patient with a very large pleural effusion. Here on the right-hand side is a little tip of the liver with the diaphragm hugging it. And then this is all fluid in the pleural space. And these are the spine, uh, the shadows from the vertebral bodies here. Lastly, hepatization of the lung, and I don't have the best image of my own, so this one I have referenced for you at the bottom, um, but when you start to get uh, really um, large pneumonias, what you can start to see is that the lung really does look like liver, but it has air bronchograms and maybe some irregularities inside. Up here, you can see a small pleural effusion, and this is what a consolidation will look like on ultrasound. There have been many different protocols. Uh, promoted for lung ultrasound in general. Um, the principle to sort of take home is that you wanna compare side to side and wanna look through the entire lung. We're gonna talk about the uh, protocol specific for COVID-19 in just a second. So again, you wanna choose the correct probe for what you're looking for. If you're doing something for the, the pleural line that's superficial, you wanna use a linear probe. If you're assessing the full lung parenchyma, you wanna use a curvilinear or phased array probe. I will say if you have a very thin patient that's cachectic, um, the curvilinear probe, that wide base probe here, um, it may be hard to, uh, you might get a lot of shadowing from those ribs. So in that case, choosing the cardiac probe or the phased array probe can sometimes fit between the ribs a little bit better. They both are low frequency probes, so both are adequate. So, you know, these are all the findings you might consider on lung ultrasound, A lines and B lines we talked about. Z lines are a small artifact from the pleural line the pleural effusions and consolidations. Um, and these things are all gonna be talked about in the literature that you find for COVID-19. Um, so let's move on to COVID-19 specifically. 
Um, so just as a disclaimer, you know, this is new to me too. I have not been doing lots of COVID-19 scanning yet, but as with all ultrasound scans, the only way to learn is to do it. So I encourage you, if it's appropriate, to bring the ultrasound machine with you and assess your patients with the machine, because the more you do, the better you're going to get at this. Um, Mike Stone is a famous ultrasound guru here in the United States, and uh, that's his Twitter handle there if you want to follow him. But what he always says is if you don't do a good scan going in, you're not going to get a good interpretation going out. So you need to practice and you need to address those image optimization techniques that I talked about, like setting your focus and your game correctly. So this is my uh, proposal from reading the literature of what to do. So firstly, will it change your management? Focus101.com put together this nice little spreadsheet. If you're not going to be keeping that patient in the hospital, if they already look really well and you're planning to send them home, don't bring the ultrasound with you. It's a way to get contaminated. It also puts you as the provider in very close proximity to the patient because it's be close enough to scan them on their chest. So as much as I love ultrasound and advocate it's used for everything, if it's not going to change your management, skip it for this patient. Secondly, you need to prepare. This is a slide put together by the Canadian Point of Care Ultrasound Society. They have one for a cart-based system. That's this one. They also have one for handheld devices. And as you can see, it's it's quite a process to prepare yourself to go into one of these patients' rooms with your PPE and protecting your machine and then how to clean up afterwards. Three, you're gonna scan. Now, interestingly, this Italian group, Soldati et al, uh, came up with a protocol that we're gonna talk about and go through their scoring system that they've developed. Um, but you'll notice that this is far more spaces to scan than what I showed you in a previous slide. And that's because what we're finding is that uh, this, the changes that we're seeing in the lung are often found more posteriorly. So um, advocating for more scanning on the back. So you're gonna do two anterior, two in the axillary line, and um, three spots on the back, and then both sides. And then step four is to interpret the image. So again, I haven't collected enough of a library to share with you COVID patients, but this one's from the POCUS Atlas online, and they publish a whole bunch of interesting findings. But if you look here, you can see here's the pleural line, and it looks really raggedy, kind of thickened. And over here, you can see this like hypoechoic uh, area right under the pleural line, and that's like a little small subpleural consolidation. So what are you looking for on um, with patients with COVID? First of all, Focal B lines, meaning they're not diffuse, they're not in all lung fields, but you see them here and there. That's what we see in the early and mild cases. This can progress though. Um, the next thing that we're seeing is a lot of thickening of the pleural line and irregularity, like I showed you in that previous slide. You might start seeing confluent B lines in more severe disease or in ARDS like patients. Um, those subpleural consolidations, we're going to look at them a little bit more carefully. And then importantly, it's sort of rare to see pleural effusion. So if you're scanning at the basis and seeing that spine sign and large pleural effusion, you might consider an alternate diagnosis other than COVID. So this is that same group, Soldati et al, uh, talking about their protocol and scoring system. And what they did was they over 60,000 frames of COVID positive patients, um, and they blinded the information to the scanner and then grouped the uh, findings of the scans by severity that they are seeing of abnormalities. And they had an engineer come up with a grading system, and we're going to go through that system now. So in the score of zero, what we're seeing here, as you can see, is nice, thin, regular, uh, very crisp pleural line with normal A lines beneath it. And when you use the curvilinear probe here, um, we're looking deeper, we see that nice like normal A-line pattern, almost looks like totally normal lungs. Well, there's normal lungs. As the disease progresses, um, you start to see irregularity of this pleural line when you look with the linear probe, more irregular. And we're starting to see a little bit of uh, uh, like the B-lines coming, but they're kind of uh, rare, they're not everywhere. Um, and that's sort of your mild disease pattern. In score of two, now we're developing what are subpleural consolidations. So there's a red arrow here pointing to, I'm gonna move my probe so you can see it, but these little tiny hypochoic things beneath the pleural line are small subpleural consolidations. And now we're seeing more confluent B lines forming on the curvilinear uh, probe. And in uh, the score of three, now we can see these sort of large subpleural consolidations. Can you see this large hypochoic area? It's got some irregularity to it. Um, we're getting B lines that are filling up an entire lung space. And here they put side by side normal A line score of zero versus the confluent B line score of three. So here they are all are together. And they're recommending that this sort of be adapted as an international standard so that we're all talking about the same thing and grading the same way. Um, as we've done with other things, like how we grade 
you know, hydronephrosis, for example. Um, and then multiple other studies have come out, and these are some of them. So this is a case report uh, put together uh, where th this patient here has COVID-19. So again, what we're seeing is irregularity of that pleural line, some subpleural consolidations between these two. We're seeing these large blue lines, thickening of the, li of the pleural line here. And when we compare that to a another patient who also presented with respiratory symptoms, but not COVID-19, you see this patient has a thin, nice, regular pleural line with these A lines. She still has some B lines, but they certainly look different than the patient with COVID-19. So there's definitely a pattern that we're seeing. And that's been confirmed in many other studies. Pang et al. put together a really interesting um, study that compared the CT findings on lung uh, of COVID patients with their ultrasound findings. And what we're seeing is that we really can correlate these things very, very well. And this is really helpful if you're in a setting where you don't have access to CT scan. And so thickening of the pleural on, on, lung, uh, on lung CT, we know that we've seen that on ultrasound. Um, what they're calling ground glass shadowing, we're seeing B lines. What they're seeing is subpleural consolidations you can see on some with the ultrasound. So it's very, uh, they correlate very, very well. Um, at the end of this article, they introduced four points that I thought were interesting, although they didn't uh, include any data about them, but something to consider. That ultrasound, like I said, is repeatable. So you might be able to track evolution of disease, and I'm gonna show you a physician that did that on himself. Um, you can sort of see if your maneuvers, like proning the patient or uh, you know increasing their PEEP, is that helping with their lung, are their lung ultrasounds improving? And then potentially guide your decision to wean their ventilator. Um, they didn't, again, provide any data for this, but they're just sort of theories that ultrasound might be helpful in these uh, four areas. Um, again, another study that came out in the beginning of March that showed um, several patients who um, presented with COVID symptoms, and again, same findings, B lines, subpleural consolidations, uh, thickened pleural line. So this is that physician I was referring to, um, and he's based in Madrid. Um, this was published again on the pocusatlas.com, so I highly recommend you go on there and take a look. This he recorded his own lungs from day one to day 20 of his disease. I'm going to show you a few of them, but it's really interesting to kind of look at all of them together. So on day one, this is his first scan of himself, relatively normal. We're seeing A lines. Uh, this is now liver, but here's like a pleural line, and you can see A lines kind of reverberating, no B lines. Versus day four, where he's starting to see some thickening of his own pleural line here. Um, there's maybe a subpleural consolidation that's forming and a B line. Again, day seven, kind of progressing, more B lines looking a little bit worse, and you can follow the rest uh, on that website. So Denver Health in Colorado uh, put together this really nice card that if you're doing a lot of ultrasound, you might consider downloading it and printing it, laminating it, putting it in your department. Um, just as a reminder to providers who maybe don't do ultrasound all the time, but what they should be looking for um, with the same findings that we've been talking about. And so I'd like to open up the uh, discussion now for questions and uh, for Dr. Big to talk a little bit about his experience in Pakistan. Thank you so much, Danielle, for that, that excellent, uh, excellent informative PowerPoint. Um, what I'm going to do right now is just uh, put up really quick the email address that you guys can send your questions to. So you should be able to see that now. And uh, at any point during the seminar, if you have a question, just send it to that address. Uh, so uh, Dr. Begg, um, we've heard a little bit about the ultrasound basics and the findings in COVID from Dr. Matilski. Um, what is, uh, what's ultrasound like in your shop? How are, how are you guys using it? Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Nico, for directing that question to me. First of all, I'm uh, just going to thank Dr. Daniel for that amazing discussion, uh, which I'm really glad to be a part of. And uh, uh, in continuation of the discussion today, I have a presentation of my own, uh, which I'll be sharing with you guys, uh, just to talk about you know, the COVID-19 experience in Pakistan. Um, let me just uh, share this. Right. So uh, let me just uh, start off by saying that emergency medicine is a five-year training program which is affiliated by the uh, College of Physicians and Surgeons of Pakistan and was formally introduced in 2012 
when I enrolled as part of the first batch to train under CPSP. And ultrasound has not yet been deemed as a uh, mandatory part of the tra tra training curriculum. And the trainees of certain institutions do get to rotate in radiology for a limited duration of time. But I personally believe that uh, it may need to be modified if we are to consider training and certifying them for performing a variety of ultrasounds beyond the ones uh, that they now normally do, which are for seeking ultrasound guidance during bedside procedures such as CVC and Joket line insertion. And this is just a snapshot of real-time statistics of COVID-19 cases uh, coming up in Pakistan, which is regulated and updated daily by the Ministry of National Health Services. And these numbers are presently growing, indicating that we still have a long way to go before we get safely to the other side. Now, uh, current data um, has shown that ultrasound is a useful modality for assessment of COVID-19 cases, just like Dr. Daniel uh, described in her part of the discussion. Uh, so I wanted to share some findings that I have personally observed during my shifts while attending uh, to such patients. Now, uh, this is a ultrasound from patient A who presented to us in the ER with fever and respiratory distress for past one week. And uh, this gentleman was quite hypoxic and tachypneic on arrival. A quick thoracic ultrasound uh, with a curvilinear probe directed at the basis of the lungs revealed a diffuse curly B line. And you would also notice a hypoechoic uh, vertical artifact that I believe uh, could be due to uh, subpleural consolidation. And uh, this is the chest extra of the same patient, uh, which was reported as having bilateral infiltrates. The patient was highly suspected of COVID-19 infection and was managed with supplemental oxygen and, you know, the awake proning uh, measures, which showed some minimal improvement. Now, uh, this was uh, an ultrasound that we did on patient B. In fact, the, my resident did on patient uh, who presented with difficulty in breathing for past few days. And he was hemodynamically stable. And uh, we decided to quickly perform an ultrasound scan of the chest. And by placing a linear probe at the right inferior lateral thorax at the level of fifth to seventh intercostal space, we noticed a very thick pleural line. So we recommended for further testing. And this was the same gentleman's CT scan. As you can see, he has a ground glass opacity in the same location, uh, apart from other territories as well. And this warranted further testing for possible COVID-19 infection. And this is, uh, these are the ultrasound scans from the same patient, C, who presented to us with fever, difficulty in breathing, and lethargy. As you may notice that the ultrasound images, uh, both the ultrasound images show consolidated lung parenchyma with uh, minimal pleural effusions collecting in the peripheries uh, bilaterally. And uh, this was quite obvious on a chest x-ray which showed similar findings. The COVID-19 PCR came out as positive and the patient was admitted uh, in the hospital. So in conclusion to the case discussions above, I would like to emphasize uh, findings that were shared on this letter by Dr. Kian, and this was also mentioned by Dr. Daniel in her presentation as well, uh, that lung ultrasound uh, is a very essential means to minimize healthcare worker exposure, especially in times of this pandemic, due to the feasibility of being able to perform it on the bedside and uh, providing safety to the patient as well, who might be unstable for transfer to the department for a CT scan. However, a recognized limitation of lung ultrasound is that it cannot penetrate very deep into the lungs, uh, requiring the abnormality to essentially extend up to the pleura in order to be uh, better visualized. Um, I wanted to include another very relevant study included in the Social Science Repository Network, or SSRN, which was published by Dr. Yi Huang et al. And uh, in his study of 20 non-critical COVID-19 patients, he describes observing curly B lines as the most common finding, uh, along with the tendency for lung lesions to most commonly occur at the basal parts of the lung, which are quite evident on the diagram. So I believe uh, that if you were to scan any part of the lung, depending on the factor of time and the patient's compliance to the exam, then the basal parts of the lung would be the most important area to look for. Of course, making sure that you scan rest of the lungs as well, so you, that you do not risk losing the possibility of further findings present in any other different location. 
Uh, now I'll be briefly talking about the difficulties encountered in solutions to building emergency point of care ultrasound capacity in Pakistan. And I came across this uh, really interesting article which was published by Dr. Sachita et al. in Critical Ultrasound Journal in 2015, which was a cross-session survey on 1,435 healthcare professionals belonging to low to middle income nations. And it discusses significant barriers to the use of ultrasound, mostly due to a lack of ultrasound training unavailability of equipment, machine malfunction, and inability to perform maintenance on existing machines. And in the end of my discussion, I divided proposed solutions into two fundamental aspects, one being developing ultrasound skills, which can come through online distance learning modules combined with evaluation protocols that can basically assess you for image acquisition and interpretation. And this can be further uh, promoted uh, into a train the trainer model whereby on site training skill can become readily accessible and available. The other solution I wanted to highlight is the possibility of tele ultrasound in improving uh, patient care. And this was systematically reviewed by Dr. Noel et al. in their study of tele ultrasound in resource limiting settings uh, published in Frontiers in Public Health in 2019 where they concluded that tele-ultrasound is a feasible, accurate uh, modality and can alter the clinical diagnosis and management, thus it can be something that can be uh, looked forward to. So in conclusion, I would like to say that in relevance to the present pandemic, emergency point of care ultrasound is a useful imaging tool which can help us safely screen and possibly diagnose patients and serially follow them up to see improvement after clinical management. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bay, for that presentation. Uh, it was very interesting uh, to see the case presentations in particular that you've developed and posted. I'm going to uh, share again the email address for uh, emailing your questions. And let me just make sure we have it up in presentation mode. Can everybody see that clearly? Yeah, that's good. Okay, perfect. Um, so, uh, first, uh, to you, Dr. Begg, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Matilski. Um, you showed some uh, images of ultrasound as well as uh, chest x-ray and a CT scan in your presentation. Could you go into, you know, in your shop, what some of the considerations are, whether you're going to get an ultrasound or a chest x-ray? or a CT scan, or whether you feel like you, you need all of them or just a few of them? What are some right. of the pros and cons and what goes into your clinical decision-making at that point? Uh, you know, uh, Dr. Nico, it generally depends on uh, the patient. Uh, as you may all know, because uh, you may be receiving these cases uh, in your hospitals as well, that these COVID-19 patients are coming with uh, uh, a certain severity of symptoms. Uh, some of the cases might be mild, and uh, they might be hemodynamically stable. So you can just go ahead and you can take a good history. You can try and examine these cases as best as possible. And if need be, you can quickly do a thoracic ultrasound just to see if uh, there are any findings on their lungs. Um, especially I would uh, include the patients who come to you with hypoxic, uh, in a, with hypoxia. Now, these are the cases that really need to be assessed quickly at the bedside. You don't have the luxury of, uh, you know, waiting for a chest x-ray to happen and, uh, you know, sending them to the department for a CT scan of the chest. But I would tell you this, that even though if, we, if I do get to perform a point of care ultrasound on their thorax, I still need to go ahead and perform a subsequent imaging modality, such as starting with a basic chest radiograph, because it's more convenient it's more portable and uh, then if I need be, uh, if the patient is stable enough uh, and if required, if the findings are very indiscriminate on a chest x-ray, then maybe we go ahead and uh, arrange the patient to have a conventional CT scan. Dr. Matilski, how does it work in your shop? I think it's a little bit difficult uh, to, again, generalize as, as we're hearing from Dr. Bakes, sort of similar problems. What I find is that um, in the patient who's unstable, your ultrasound is invaluable. It is quick. It's at the bedside. You can do it at one of my slides. I sort of briefly mentioned that you should do your ultrasound in conjunction with um, the heart and the IVC because, you know, 
uh, COVID-19 has its a stereotypical findings. And congestive heart failure has its, and PEs have ha, has theirs. So um, for the acute dysmic patient, um, I highly encourage you to you know rely heavily on your ultrasound because it's going to give you a whole lot of information about you know the, the entire cardiopulmonary system. Um, where I work, unfortunately, my ultrasound machine, my ultrasound images can't be shared with other providers in the medical record. So um, sometimes I find myself getting additional imaging, even after I've decided that, you know, this is likely COVID-19. But, you know, to communicate with other providers, we do go ahead and get a chest x-ray. Um, we do know from you know, older literature that uh, chest x-ray sensitivity is much, much lower than ultrasounds. So I have seen abnormal ultrasound findings with a normal chest x-ray, and it's not for another day or so until the chest x-ray findings are abnormal. Um, so, you know, on the flip side of that, for the really, wa um, you know, walking well type of patient who's coming in with very low risk symptoms, who you're going to swab and send home, and your ultrasound's not going to change, they're, you know, they don't have an oxygen requirement, their vital signs are otherwise totally normal, and you're going to send them home, I would not bring your ultrasound machine in the room. Expose yourself for a prolonged period of time at the bedside. You know, these are very intimate uh, exams, right, because we're going to be as close to put the probe on a patient's chest. Um, as you need to get, and you're also exposing your entire machine, and you have to go through the disinfectant kind of protocols for that. So I would sort of, you know, for the very ill patient, invaluable, absolutely recommend that you bring your ultrasound for them. For the really walking well, you know, I think I would probably skip it. And, uh, you know, I would add to that also, Dr. Daniel, that uh, in fact, some of the articles that are coming up have mentioned that the point of care ultrasound especially for COVID-19 pneumonia is as good as uh, the CT scan, uh, according yep. to the findings, just like you shared. And in fact, it works better than a simple chest radiograph. But uh, right. like you said, uh, it depends on the clinical setting. I mean, uh, we mostly do still end up getting a chest x-ray on the patient at least, and a CT scan if we need to. Yeah. And I think that, you know, the problem is that these patients are very prothrombotic. Uh, so they are having higher rates of pulmonary embolism, at least it seems so from anecdotal experience. So, you know, you can't have a one, one fits all kind of approach. Um, but I definitely agree in terms of sensitivity, ultrasound sensitivity and long ultrasound overall is probably in the 90% of finding things versus 70%, I think, uh, or some in the 70 percentile range for a chest x-ray. So um, certainly something to you know, develop your skill at because it's really helpful for this particular infection and all respiratory patients in general. You guys have both mentioned some, uh, some very high sensitivities uh, and even specificities for ultrasound in these patients. Uh, so it sounds like a good diagnostic tool. Uh, we're hearing that a lot of these nasal swabs are maybe only 70% sensitive and we know that the chest x-ray you know isn't all that sensitive at all have you guys seen um any use of ultrasound to uh let's say you know establish a you know an, uh, a diagnosis or at least a suspicion of a diagnosis of covid especially in locations where uh, a nasal swab isn't available or it will take three or four days to come back do you know of anybody who's using ultrasound to classify a patient as a COVID patient? Oh, well, uh, Dr. Nico, in my hospital, what we are doing is that uh, normally not a lot of physicians are very expert in performing point of care ultrasound, especially when you're dealing with a COVID-19 patient who's highly contagious and you want to take all those precautions of not uh, exposing uh, yourself uh, or your devices. Uh, so you better be very focused when you're going in dealing with these patients. You, you got to know what you are looking for in a very limited amount of time. So I'm just going to say that it depends on the uh, the provider, you know, who's dealing with the patient. Just like Dr. Daniel mentioned in her presentation that uh, it's essential that uh, you're adapted performing the ultrasound so that you know uh, uh, the findings and you can correlate them with the patient's history and presentation. Um, uh, for instance, the cases that I shared in my presentation were largely done under my supervision and some of the cases I did uh, by myself. And uh, so that kind of gave me an idea that this patient, according to their history, according to their exam, their hemodynamic parameters can be a possible COVID-19 suspect 
or can highly be a uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, suspect. Uh, needless to say, uh, like I said, that uh, there is no clear-cut diagnostic algorithm as uh, per se that would allow me to delineate them that this is a COVID-19 pneumonia. Uh, they would still need further testing either by a, poly uh, by a PCR or you know, further imaging. So uh, I, I would uh, like to hear Dr. Daniel's experience uh, with this as well. Yeah, I don't know that I've seen a study out yet that's um, compared lung ultrasound to, um, you know, swab or PCR testing, like head to head. I think it's a really interesting idea. Um, I think most of these studies have used the PCR as sort of their control to compare their, like, you know, we know this is a COVID patient, is our ultrasound showing, you know, matching with what we know and using the PCR sort of as the gold standard to compare the scan to. So I haven't seen one yet that's done it sort of the other way around. Um, but I do think that it, you know, it's kind of in the same realm of, um, you know, your D-dimer, for example. Uh, you know, it kind of gives you, a, your D-dimer is a lab test, your ultrasound shows right heart strain. With those two pieces of information, you may choose to get a CT scan to prove the patient has a pulmonary embolism, but you already have a really good idea of what's going on. And so I think in the same kind of vein, you're scanning this patient, you're seeing the subpleural consolidation, thickening of the pleural line, you know, patchy distribution of B lines and not such a large pleural effusion. I think if you have those findings on ultrasound with a good history, I think you can be fairly confident that, you know, you're at least you're considering COVID-19 as a high, high part of your differential diagnosis. I think it'll be very interesting to sort of see this disease play out and then kind of do it in the other direction. Like we think this patient has COVID and then test it against the, uh, the PCR test later. But I don't think people have done that just yet. Or at least I haven't seen it yet. So it sounds like we can at least convince ourselves that we're, we're pretty suspicious of COVID given the clinical presentation and, and the ultrasound findings. I'd like to hear a little bit about uh, the experience both of you have had with uh, consultants. Um, once you've uh, admitted the patient or you're in a discussion with you know, the ICU doctor or uh, the, the medical doctor on the floor, um, basically the admitting team, I think it, you know, it, it seems pretty helpful if you have an x-ray to show them or the, the CT scan read. But it, if you did an ultrasound, maybe you even saved the pictures and you can show them the pictures. What's been your experience and in, in whether they're able to interpret those pictures and, and how much they trust your interpretation of the ultrasound and, and your ultrasound capabilities? Um, and we'll start with uh, Dr. Matilski and then go over to Dr. Begg. I think that's really institution specific. And I think that's a very broad question, uh, Dr. Risco, because um, we see this not just with lung ultrasound and COVID-19, but all bedside ultrasound. So there's been study after study after study that has shown um, that emergency physicians are uh, competent at ultrasound and have the same level of skill as when you compare it with a, te a technician or a, an echo technician or you know, we are well, well trained. The fellowship that we do here is very rigorous um, in most of the fellowships that I have, um, you know, met with their program directors and spoken to them at national conferences. Um, so I think um, we, there, there was a study that came out that looked at consultant services and their impression of ER physicians ultrasound. And they broke it down by specialty internal medicine, surgery, obstetrics, et cetera. And it's very interesting to see internal medicine is fairly confident in ER skill um, overall, with our surgical specialties sometimes less confident in our skill. And I wonder if some of that has to do with the risk of, of you know, I'm telling you the patient has cholecystitis you're going to take them to an operating room based on my interpretation, you know, you might be a little bit more hesitant to do an operation on a patient um, without confirmatory testing or comprehensive uh, scanning from, from a radiology department versus, you know, me telling you like this person is hypoxic, they're tachycardic, they're febrile, they're coughing, they feel terrible. And my ultrasound confirms that I think they have COVID-19. And then your medicine colleagues are a little bit more willing to accept that as, as a diagnostic tool. Um, the other the other piece of this thing is when you can show somebody an image, it helps immensely. So if I can show you, like, here's the B-lines that I'm talking about and the subpleural consolidation, then another physician can have confidence that, like, they're, um, that, you're, that your scan is accurate and that this is what I've seen in the literature and I agree with what I'm seeing here. 
Um, so I think it just sort of depends. I think that point of care ultrasound is growing immensely. We see it in most in, um, intensive care units. So it's great um, going back to that vocabulary that I had put up on one of my slides. I really encourage you to use the correct vocabulary when you're speaking to a consultant because if you're informed and you're confident in what you're doing, then people will have confidence in you. Um, and again, lastly, I would just say, you know, you have to do good scans to make good interpretations. So if you're not confident in what you're doing, you know, you're not going to your consultants won't be confident in you either. So practice, practice, practice. How are your consultants treating you over there, Dr. Beg? Are they trusting your skills and the skills of your colleagues in the ultrasound use and interpretation? Well, Dr. Nico, that's a very debatable question. The problem is that even uh, right now, uh, it's so hard to convince a cardiologist that the patient has congestive heart failure and a pulmonologist that the patient has pneumonia. Usually they start, you know, arguing and debating between the two diagnoses. Now, talking about COVID-19 cases that we receive in our emergency, um, well, uh, we don't have a way to like, you know, save or record the uh, images and uh, share them with the rest of the colleagues beyond the ones that we have uh, in the emergency room. Uh, mostly what we do is that because we are generally receiving a lot of cases now with uh, suspected fever and difficulty in breathing, so we have a particular differential for COVID-19 pneumonia as well. Uh, that is why uh, if we feel as if this patient can be a suspected case of COVID-19 infection, we still go ahead and uh, start testing them further with, uh, you know, uh, with a PCR or further you know, a chest radiograph. The point of care uh, bedside ultrasound, as it may, it's just uh, it's just to serve uh, us frontliners as a imaging tool for diagnosing, and uh, you know, repeating repeatedly checking on the patient whether our therapy is working on them or not. But um, like Dr. Daniel said, uh, you just have to like you know be very uh, sharp with them. You have to communicate with them with the right uh, type of vocabulary. Uh, so as to convince them that this can be most likely a COVID-19 case, um, but you, st you do still need to uh, test them, uh, nevertheless. Wonderful. So let's turn it over to some questions from the audience. Um, we have a question from uh, Dr. Janaid Razak, and it was echoed by a few other people. They're wondering uh, how useful is a negative or a normal chest ultrasound in ruling out the diagnosis, or even as a prognostic indicator, if the ultrasound is negative, do we feel like this is a patient who will do well and can go home? Uh, I think that you know we have you take it in context of the of the entire patient's uh, presentation. But um, one of the uh, that physician that I had mentioned in Madrid, Spain, um, had documented his lung findings over several days. So it's a very dynamic process. So while I think a normal lung ultrasound on day one of the disease is fairly reassuring and seeing only, you know, scattered, you know, a scattered beeline here or there, if they're oxygenating well, I think that's pretty reassuring that they can, that their disease is mild. But I, <clears throat> I would caveat that by saying we have seen, as with that physician who, who's whose images are published online, you can look at them, um, a significant progression of disease uh, as, as the, you know, two weeks or so, three weeks even that he was sick for. Um, so I think that, you know, having a normal lung ultrasound uh, with reassuring vital signs is something that I would, you know, say that, you know, this is, this is a patient that can safely be discharged and with strict return, return precautions, I would say that if you're finding some really significant lung um, abnormalities with those subcortical consolidations and that patient is maybe doing okay at the moment, you might want to put them in your observation unit um, because we know that that person has got a more uh, significant disease burden. Okay. Um, I'm going to start with you for the next one, Dr. Beg. So, there's some interest about teleultrasound and exactly what that means and what it entails, um, and also about whether ER residents can be trained via teleultrasound. Uh, so, could you describe uh, exactly what you mean by teleultrasound, what it, what it entails, and, and what the process looks like? Right. So, uh, because I was a little uh, unsure about the total amount of time given for the presentation, so I just mentioned the article for teleultrasound in resource-limited settings. 
the article essentially describes the uh, you know the utility of uh, performing ultrasound at a remote site and then sharing those images and clips with a particular expert in ultrasound in another uh, country or area uh, who has formal training or experience in performing ultrasound so uh, the tele ultrasound is a useful modality for instance if you're trying to introduce ultrasound skill if you want to build capacity for ultrasound especially point of care ultrasound then you can essentially use this uh, method of uh, maybe performing you know um, ultrasounds at uh, in pakistan and then having share having sharing them with uh, you know physicians who are sitting in uh, uh, let's say in the us uh, who maybe for are trained with uh, you know ultrasound skills so that they they can give their live feedback regarding the acquisition of image and uh, you know the subsequent interpretation uh tele ultrasound can also be used as uh, a training tool uh, i believe there i just i mentioned in part of my presentation that uh, online distance learning modules uh, sometimes require that the uh, the uh, participants uh, essentially save and record their, uh, their their images as well as clips of what they do on the patient at the bedside and then they share them Uh, or maintain their log books and then uh, show them to their you know uh, supervisors who may then sign them off whether they have uh, taken the proper image or still or video and whether they are able to interpret it correctly or not so i think it has potential uh, you just need to be open minded it's uh, a lot of work i would tell you but uh, you know it works have you encountered any tele ultrasound use dr matilski um I I think that there I've heard some reports of its use in um two different areas one in Italy I went to a lecture that where they explained that um they had an ultrasound machine on the ambulance and um there's a screen sharing platform like like this um where a physician who is remote from the ambulance is able to see um both a, a picture of the operator the uh the medic in the ambulance with the patient you can actually see that uh happening in real time as well as um a live feed of what the ultrasound image is looking like on the machine screen and what they're using this for is to um do a fast exam and trauma and if they find free fluid then they can direct that ambulance to a trauma center uh and so what that is enabling the physician to do is to give real feedback like for example you know move more posterior with your probe or angle the probe more towards the patient's you know right or left or slide or rock whatever however you would um give some tactile feedback to the actual operator by watching him do the scan as well as being able to interpret the scan remotely so that was pretty cool information i heard at a lecture um maybe a year and a half ago um the other place i've heard it being used remotely is sort of in the same vein um they're not looking at the actual operator but training medics um in places that have long transport times to look for a pneumothorax and then the physician um who's interpreting the image um offsite can kind of direct whether or not they do a needle decompression on the ambulance or not those are the two uses i've heard most recently i think it's a really awesome idea um certainly in light of of our advances in in screen sharing and and these uh potentially from from covid itself these zoom meetings kind of may change how we do ultrasound and interpret ultrasound and then to what dr big was saying about telelearning i think that's an excellent idea um i know i've been participating with an organization that has set up uh some telelearning where you know a uh, uh, an instructor from here is being paired with a uh practitioner who's still learning ultrasound um in a research limited area of uganda and then they're able to share their images and get feedback uh on how their scanning technique is and how it can adjust it sort of like a remote video review if you will and i think that that's a really interesting way to um sort of share our knowledge and skills uh especially in places that are difficult to reach um in traditional sort of didactic programs well i'd like to thank you both unfortunately we are running low on time there are a few questions here uh it's been a lively audience there's a few questions that we uh, won't have time to get to but Uh what I think we could do is we'll we will go through the questions that have been emailed and we will try to respond to everybody offline uh directly. So if you still have questions remaining please feel free to email them uh to that address coe.te@aku.edu and we will endeavor to reply to everybody who has submitted a question. Um this has been a really wonderful discussion. I'd like to thank both of our guests for taking time uh to be with us today. 
I'd like to thank the uh, Center of Excellence, including uh, Tahla Rahman and Shoban Chalglani, as well as Priyanka Agrawal at Johns Hopkins for all of your hard work in putting this together. And a special thanks to Dr. Uh, Janaid Razak for sponsoring this series. Uh, thank so you guys good... so much for having us. Thank, thank you. you so much. A good day to uh, all of those in the West and a good evening to those in the East. Everybody stay safe. Uh, what you do matters. You're doing important work. And uh, Ramadan Mubarak. Uh, take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. -bye. Bye,